Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Foreign Press Association in New York. Uh, this is Ian Williams. I'm the president, and I write for newspapers and magazines and many other things. And no, whereof Catherine Olmsted writes in her book, The Newspaper Access, Six Press Barons Who Enabled Hitler. And it wasn't just Hitler, they also enabled uh, Emperor Hiro Tojo and all the others in Japan. I mean, I had not realized that uh, one of these press barons had actually leaked the war plans of the United States and got away with it. It's got shades of current arguments about what's, uh, what's permissible. Um, and it seems that if newspaper barons can get away with it, then why can't ex-presidents? But that's... <laughs> taking a very relaxed view of it uh, uh, and what security means. Um, and they were sort of wired about security then. Uh, there was a famous science fiction writer who had envisaged an atom bomb in his short, one of his short stories in a science fiction magazine and got the full treatments as the FBI, the NSA and all the others came banging on his door <laughs> to find out where he got the stuff from. But uh, leaking actual reports is going a bit further. So, I mean, the you say six newspaper barons, and you've chosen them because what you show, and I think is often missing in these conversations, Catherine, is that there's a, it was a genuine transatlantic effort. There was an, a North Atlantic Union, not just of uh, Churchill and Roosevelt and uh, the anti-Axis people. There was an axis of evil in the sense of people on both sides in Britain and America who were determined to, um, in a sense, disarm the Allies and to boost the Axis in one way or another. Um, when did you when did you really notice this was a joint effort as opposed to, I mean, it's not just an anthology of uh, the peccadilloes and sins of newspaper barons, it's the fact that they were working so often in concert. Right, and it wasn't so much that they wanted their countries to disarm, they were strong nationalists and militarists, but they did not want their countries to uh, aid any uh, other nations that were uh, threatened by Hitler because they were afraid of, of provoking him. But I, I, I became aware of the transatlantic nature of this um, uh, alliance between the newspaper barons when I was looking in uh, the archives in the Houses of Parliament, um, which houses Lord Beaverbrook's papers. And so in those papers, I found his letters to Joe Patterson, who was the publisher of the New York Daily News, which was the best-selling paper in the United States at the time, a tabloid, um, very uh, populist nationalist tabloid. And um, Beaverbrook and Patterson wrote each other about what they could do to promote the cause of isolationism in their respective countries. So they actually worked on a campaign together starting in 1935, where Patterson wrote to Beaverbrook about how much he hoped that both the US and the UK would stay out of uh, what they considered the European mess and just allow whatever was happening there to transpire without any sort of British or American intervention against uh, Hitler's aggression. And uh, this, this campaign included Patterson writing letters to the Daily Express, which was Beaverbrook's paper. Beaverbrook then printed these letters on the front pages of um, the Express. And then Patterson printed Beaverbrook's letters in the Daily News. Uh, Beaverbrook put together a pamphlet about the, the joys of isolationism um, and distributed it to 10 million households in the UK. Um, and the, the centerpiece of this pamphlet was uh, Patterson's um, statements about how the US was going to stay out of Europe and how he hoped um, the UK would as well. So it, was, uh, it wasn't that they were just uh, working in their own countries, they were working together to try and undermine any efforts to aid Hitler's uh, victims on the continent. We should explain to uh, people who mightn't be all favor with it, that Lord Beaverbrook began as Max Aitken, who was a successful Canadian businessman whose success was somewhat um, disreputable, which is one of the reasons he had to leave Canada and come to Britain. 
where he, as, a, as an Ari beast uh, and an empire loyalist, he became more British than the British in some ways. But then when he went to speak to Patterson, he could say we're all North Americans together. That little matter with the border and the War of 1812, let's put that behind us <laughs> and look forward instead. So, I mean, he, he was getting the best of both worlds, really. And he ended up Lord Beaverbrook, where he was ennobled by uh, Lloyd George, I believe. Uh, Lloyd George ennobled a lot of people, usually in return for fat checks, because the British system had anticipated the American system of patronage for a brief time. Uh, Lloyd George created more peerages than anyone since the War of the Roses, I think, all of them, <laughs> based upon hefty donations and services rendered. Um, amongst the others were some of the other press barons, you know, because they were press barons. Uh, Lord Rothermere, how does he, the, the, the founder of the Daily Ma the, the Mail, the Daily Mail, how does he fit into it all, apart from in the core, in the center of the swastika? Right. Well, I, uh, I chose these six press barons because they were the most uh, influential of their time. So in the early 30s, the Daily Mail was the best-selling British newspaper. By the mid-30s, it was the Daily Express. Um, in the U.S., uh, the Daily News, as I said, was the best-selling U.S. paper. It was a tabloid. Uh, the Chicago Tribune, owned by Robert McCormick, was the best-selling regular-sized newspaper in the U.S. So collectively, these six press barons um, reached 60 million people in their two countries. And uh, all of them fought to uh, ensure that their governments did not intervene in um, uh, European affairs, to make sure that their governments did not aid uh, people who, uh, nations that were threatened by Adolf Hitler. Uh, Rothermere was really, uh, if there's a spectrum uh, of these six press, press barons from a fascist sympathizer to uh, isolationist without he's in the ultraviolet he's way out <laughs> yeah he, he was definitely uh, very much taken with hitler he vacationed with him uh he uh you know visited him many times he wrote very admiring columns about the nazis rothermere was um uh, a real anti-communist like he he sincerely believed that the soviets were going to sweep across europe and come up to uh, britain and uh communize britain and he believed that hitler was was a, a bulwark against communism and like senator mccarthy had a fairly expansive uh, definition of communist right anyone who suggested he might pay taxes for example <laughs> right. <laughs> right so uh so rothermere was uh one who i think everyone can can say today was definitely a Nazi sympathizer. Now, Beaverbrook didn't uh, admire the Nazis. He just thought that Britain shouldn't have anything to do with uh, the Nazi, with uh, opposing the Nazis. And so, for example, when Hitler reoccupied the Rhineland, he said, what does it have to do with us? You know, uh, we should not pay attention to what's happening. Well, on the Earth. Far away country of which we know little. Right, right, right. <laughs> From the time. I mean, this this was that was a sort of almost an understandable position, except you know I don't think they read the bit about the Good Samaritan in the Bible. Obviously, when um, the, the, basically these people are foreigners, let them wallow and uh, and be destroyed. See if we care. But they they're very um, Lord Rothermere. I, I hadn't realised until I read your book. He 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 actually wangled. I think you say Lord Beaverbrook wangled a place from on a, a delegation to America almost to get him out the way of the police in Britain in case he was arrested and uh, prosecuted for treason, which was yes. otherwise feasible. Right. So up until the summer of 1939, Rothermere was writing very uh, friendly letters to Hitler, um, you know, extolling him, praising him. Uh, you know, these are secret private letters, but um, the, the British Secret Service was was taking them and uh, you know copying them, and we can now look at them in the National Archives. And so, once the war started in September of 1939, uh, there Rothermere and uh, his friends were worried that Rothermere might be uh, interned or could face some consequences for his pro-Nazi views once the once the war started. And so, uh, Beaverbrook arranged in uh, the summer of 1940 for uh, Rothermere to go to uh, the United States and Canada. 
um, on a, you know, like a fact finding mission to yes, get him out of the country. And then uh, um, Rothermere was very ill at the time and he actually died before he could go back to Britain. Uh, I don't remember floods of tears or national mourning about the occasion though. Uh, I mean, it was a real fear because Sir Oswald Mosley was in town. Yeah. Uh, you don't mention it in the book, but um, they, they locked him up just to be on the safe side. And uh, even though George Orwell eventually advocated to coming out, he said, well, you know, if there was an invasion, he should be shot immediately. Uh, George, <laughs> not George Orwell, um, also, also Oswald Mosley should be shot immediately because so Oswald Mosley well, was the Union of Fascists, the British Black Shirts, who, um, and Rothermere said, hurrah for the Black Shirts on one of his famous headlines. Right, you know, Rothermere uh, was a big uh, booster of the British fascist up until about 1934. Uh, then when they started getting uh, really violent, there was one famous incident where they had a big, uh, uh, you know, forum um, and the socialists showed up and started heckling them and then the black shirts turned on the socialists and, you know, beat them to within an inch of their lives. And this got a lot of press coverage and uh, there was then pressure on Rothermere to back away from the black shirts, which, which he began to do. And he did, he never like disavowed them, but he stopped giving them such favorable press coverage uh, after 1934. Uh, but he did continue to uh, uh, extol uh, Hitler's virtues. Mm -hmm. I've got a family connection here. My father, I was told, uh, uh, pushed Oswald Mosley off a platform. <laughs> <laughs> really? Wow. <laughs> With the... Uh, perhaps unnecessary and unliberal force <laughs> knocked him off and carried on speaking. Yeah. The funny part, my friend's father's friends told me was that when the, the, the black shirts are called the police, who are usually reliably on the side of the black shirts, but when they came to the meeting, they found it was the black shirts trying to storm the platform and got the sides wrong. So they weighed in and beat up the black shirts. <laughs> it was told with a lot of amusement by my father's friends way back in the <laughs> A memorable incident, family connection to these times. But I mean, the question is, um, how much of you sort of question whether their effect on domestic politics was very great, the fact that people discounted these? But you, you, it was interesting the question you raised and didn't totally answer about why it is that um, they were fairly effective in foreign affairs. Uh, I think we often find that, that um, because foreign affairs don't hit people in their purse strings and in their wallets, um, foreign lobbies can get away with a lot more than, um, than, than domestic lobbies. Yes, I think that's, oh, sorry, my lights just went out. I have to wave. <laughs> lights are going out all over California. <laughs> right. um, I, I think that's true. Um, it's very true that um, the, uh, the, for a lot of ordinary newspaper readers, they might not be so receptive to arguments, right-wing arguments about domestic policy uh, because they had personal experience with um, the, the, you know, it really hit them in their pocketbooks and their stomachs. And so they were less liable to be manipulated. Foreign policy, they didn't pay nearly as much attention to. And so they were less likely to, um, to really put that um, in the in the front of their minds, and so they were more receptive to the arguments of the press barons about staying out of Europe. And as you pointed out, that argument is not inherently uh, objectionable. To just say, you know, okay, there's there's um, a lot of conflict over in foreign countries, and we don't have any interest there. We should just not pay any attention. Uh, particularly because if we do pay attention, then we could become the target of this dictator who's trying to take over these other countries. So like a lot of people related to that argument on that superficial level, that this is a, a you know an alarming um, situation over there and we don't wanna have anything to do with it. Um, on the other hand, you know, as we know from hindsight, the problem with that argument is that uh, you know, Hitler was not just thinking about the European continent. He, you know, did want to dominate 
uh, you know, much of the world, if not the entire world. And so it was very short sighted to say, well, we don't need to stop him from taking over Europe. He can have Europe and it won't affect us. Um, you know, let alone the moral argument, as you said, about the Good Samaritan and, you know, should we stand by and let these horrible things happen without without objecting? Oh, it has sort of echoes now about Putin. Uh, what's the, the question in Ukraine is, uh, why should we bother? And other people will answer, we should bother because if it's not Ukraine, then next is uh, Romania, Hungary, and God knows where else, uh, which is a telling argument, which was tried at the time, but failed with a lot of people. But it, it did work in the end. I mean, and you, you also describe in how comprehensive the British propaganda effort was in America with the, with the tacit and active connivance sometimes of the White House and, <clears throat> and Washington to win the, the US over to the Allied cause beforehand. Did you, did you get any more information on that? <clears throat> No, I mean, this is this is an, an area that has been, um, you know, studied by scholars in the in the past, and I didn't necessarily uncover anything on it myself, but it's an important part of the puzzle. Of course, the the Germans also had an extensive propaganda network in the US, and both the Germans and the British were working very hard, both overtly and covertly to influence American opinion because they realized that if uh, the United States started after the war began in Europe, but before American intervention, if uh, the American government started to support Britain, then uh, uh, Britain would have a much better chance of, of surviving the Nazi onslaught. Yeah, and there were, those were really dangerous times. I mean, it's, uh, I'm trying to remember, I think it was Ian Morris, Jan, Jan Morris, who wrote a book about the cabinet in 1940, sitting down there and deciding that Britain basically had enough financial reserves to fight the war on its own until 1930-43, after which they could only fight on by selling themselves cheap to the Americans. And they decided to do so, which, you know, makes, is quite patriotic, uh, uh, gives quite a patriotic feeling. But on the other hand, there are people in Britain who are uh, of the Daily Mail ilk who think that Britain made a bad mistake and should have cut a deal with Hitler at the time and preserved the British Empire, um, regardless on, 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 this, on, on principle peace. Um, so, so the arguments are still there in many ways, aren't they? Yeah, they are. And there's also, uh, you know, people in the United States on the far right who say that the United States should never have intervened, you know, uh, because it allowed, uh, intervention allowed um, the rise of the Soviet Union as a superpower after the war. And so it's just really the same arguments that they had during the war, that we're fighting the wrong enemy. Why are we fighting fascists when we should be fighting communists? And if the two of them are together, uh, are, are fighting each other, then it's clear we should always choose the anti-communist side regardless of uh, you know the moral implications of the fascist policy. Did you study at all? I mean, there are some rapid turns because from 1939 to 1941, the American Communist Party and its allies lobbied actively along with the America First to stop American intervention on the side of Britain. I mean, they were a uh, hell no, we won't go. Uh, Pete Seeger sang at the time, uh, not one of his much, not usually put in his anthologies because there was this whole era, era where uh, the communists, I think I've seen a poster cam a campaign um, poster that they had was a uh, end the British imperialist boycott of America of German workers. Mm -hmm. They say that you know end the embargo because the the British block on trade with Germany was uh, starving German workers. Of course, you know those slogans disappeared very rapidly <laughs> in 1941, but there was this period of two years where the left and right were you know. Uh, well, the far left and the right were singing from the same hymn sheet. Did you uh, get any reverberations from that with the Daily News and the others? Well, uh, yes. I mean, it was it was ironic that for at that short time that uh, William Randolph Hearst, for example, who was an extremely anti-communist uh, American newspaper baron, 
um, was on the same side as the American Communist Party in insisting on the U.S. not getting involved in the war. Um, and then, of course, they diverged again in June of 1941. When what happened? Uh, what happened? Who cares? <laughs> Right. So then suddenly when the uh, the Soviets were under attack, then the American Communist Party became among the most, uh, you know, vociferous advocates of uh, intervention in the war. Yes, in Britain, uh, the Communist Party, was, they were locked up with those old Mosley for a while. And uh, I think the, the Daily Worker, as it was then in Britain, was banned for the period as well. And, and that comes to the question is... Um, Obviously, there's, it must have been a great strain for people in Washington uh, between the loyalty to the principle of freedom of the press and allowing outright enemy sympathizers to run newspaper campaigns, defeatist newspaper campaigns. Um, in Britain, that didn't appear because the defeatist press changed its tune and immediately the war started. But the, the American press were, you know, true to their lack of principles. They carried on right through the war on uh, basically hindering the war ever, didn't they? Well, certainly uh, the three of the four American press barons did uh, with uh, Robert McCormick, Joe Patterson and Sissy Patterson uh, were extremely skeptical of the Roosevelt administration throughout the war and its its war strategy. And you could say that to some degree, of course, this is this is just um, a democratic disagreement, you know, and it's it's a disagreement over over policy and strategy, and you should have those in a free and democratic country, even in a time of war. Um, but the Daily News, in particular. Uh, really upset the Roosevelt administration by consistently suggesting that Roosevelt um, was running the war in such a way that he wanted to ensure that he could become a dictator. And the Daily News repeatedly um, suggested, predicted that Roosevelt was going to cancel presidential elections um, or midterm elections in order to consolidate power. Um, so that, uh, you know, this arguably has a big effect on American morale. Uh, if you're, if the, the best-selling newspaper in the country is suggesting that the president is, is really his, his main goal in the war is not to defeat fascism or defend the United States, but figure out a way to become a dictator uh, of the United States and eventually a world dictator. Yeah, I mean, we... Because we, we got sort of caught in a rosy glow from the 50s to the 70s to perhaps Richard Nixon, where, you know, the, this, well, the myth of the good war, that everyone united together on the cause came out, when in fact those uh, ugly undercurrents stayed there, the John Birch Society and the others, and they're still there, they're, they've revived now, and, and uh, this time they've been pandering to the Kremlin rather than to... Uh, rather than to Berlin, but it, it's, it's an intriguing transfer through the generations of this streak of uh, self-hating patriotism that's uh, the, 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 really quite intriguing. Right, right. Well, I think what it is is that the, on, the, on the far right um, in the United States and in Britain, there's a great admiration for strongmen, you know, of whatever ideology and um, that uh, the far right in the US and the UK in the 1930s saw much to admire about Mussolini and Hitler because they were, you know, keeping order. Making uh, the trains run on time. Making the trains run on time, but, you know, making sure that hierarchies were not threatened, uh, hierarchies of, of class or race. Um, they were making their nations great again. Um, they, uh, you know, were repressing the right people. Um, Jews, communists, um, LGBTQ people. And so uh, for those right-wing press barons and, and um, just right-wingers in general in Britain and in the United States, um, the, there was a, an attraction to this idea of a strong dictator who could maintain society the way it was, right? The essence of conservatism. Um, Whereas I think today in the right wing media, there is again, you know, an admiration for, for Putin, for uh, being strong, um, aggressive, 
uh, embodying, you know, masculine domination and white nationalism and, uh, you know, maintaining order in his society. And they, they see this as um, something to admire rather than to fear. Well, in some cases, we know that the admiration for Putin has, uh, it, it has been based upon solid cash <laughs> from the oligarchs. I mean, we've got people in the British House of Lords, we've got Russian oligarchs in the British House of Lords. I don't think that uh, even in 1930s, the British were ennobling Nazi, <laughs> Nazi millionaires. But we're, Britain did it to the Russians this time. And the question comes of how much of these uh, press barons' views were based on the actual material self-interest uh, and how much was it ideologically inspired in, in a theological sense? Uh, and just how much influence did they have? Because they, they actually dictated what the newspaper, sort of anticipating Rupert Murdoch, they. They, they told journalists what they, what they wanted wanted to see in the newspapers. Right, right, definitely they did. Uh, they uh, read their newspapers every day. It wasn't that they were, you know, off on their yacht somewhere and let the newspapers run themselves and occasionally they'd write an editorial. They were involved in the day-to-day -day processes and Beaverbrook, for example, uh, you know, even when he was at home, he had telephones in every room of his house and he was constantly yelling into the telephone and demanding that stories or headlines be written or changed uh, in a certain way. Uh, William Randolph Hearst, Robert McCormick, also extremely hands-on with uh, writing, you know, dozens of memos a day about how they interpreted the, the coverage of uh, in their newspapers and wanted it changed. So uh, it wasn't just the editorials, it was very much they were, they were influencing uh, the news coverage. And, um, you know, it's, I, I, you make the, um, the suggestion that this is similar to Murdoch, I think it's maybe even perhaps more extreme because that, that's all they did was read their newspapers and decide, um, you know, and make suggestions about, or, or orders about how to change it. And as far as material interests go, um, you know, that's always been debated. I think the, the biggest debate was about William Randolph Hearst, um, who was alleged to have taken a bribe from the Nazis in return for giving them um, favorable coverage. Um, no one has ever found proof of this, though. But he was in financial bad straits in the early 30s, wasn't he? He was. He was. And, you know, it was widely rumored that he had taken $400,000 uh, from the Nazi government. And, uh, at, at one point, it was even, you know, published in a magazine, and then he sued for libel. He very much kept on top of this and kept denying it. So, and no one's ever found proof that this was actually the case. So we don't have any, uh, you know, evidence that they were motivated by personal financial gain, that they were personally taking checks, although it was rumored. There was no, there's no evidence of that. I think more broadly, it's just ideological. It's, you know, I'm a very, very rich man. Um, I like order in society. I like the way things are. I like capitalism. And I, I, I like white nationalism. And I see in the Nazis nothing to object to, or uh, at least very little to object to. And certainly we should not do anything to possibly provoke Hitler so that then he turns on us, because then that would, a war would, as it did, of course, create all kinds of turmoil that can lead to the overturning of these hierarchies that the uh, press barons and many rich people in both countries at the time, uh, you know, so wanted to preserve. Now, one of the aspects, since we mentioned him, um, may as well keep on flogging the live horse, uh, Rupert Murdoch, um, he has a record of, inf of his letting his coverage be influenced by commercial interests, not in necessarily a crude sense of for example, he cancelled the advance for Chris Patton's biography as the former um, governor of China, of, of Hong Kong, uh, in, to keep favour with the Chinese and his, his enterprises inside China. Uh, was, was Hearst doing the same thing inside, uh, inside the Axis? Was he, I'm sorry, was he doing well, what? Was, was, was he trading, trading on his favourable coverage? to get better access. For example, I think you mentioned 
uh, for, for the for the newsreel sections of the media empire in in, uh, in, yes. in the Nazi realms. Yes, that that there is uh, documentary evidence of. Uh, Hearst was, you know, like a modern media mogul, and that he had his his fingers in every pie. He not only had the biggest newspaper chain in the United States and the most readers, he also had um, high circulation magazines, and he had uh, a, a motion picture uh, studio. And he also had newsreels. Uh, it was one of the five or six newsreel companies at the time. And he did a deal with the German film company, the official government Nazi German film company in 1934, where his uh, newsreels or segments of them were shown in Germany. And in return, he agreed to show um, German film to place film shot by the Nazis in his newsreel coverage of Nazi Germany in the United States. So it was an agreement he made to place unfiltered Nazi propaganda in American newsreels, uh, where American people would learn visually of what was happening in Europe through film that was shot by Nazi um, uh, cinematographers. And so this was this was known at the time. It was highly controversial. And as I said, some people went further and said, and he also took a check. Um, but that we don't know for sure. But we do know that he made this film swapping agreement that lasted for uh, many years throughout the 1930s. And if you look at, as I have at the Hearst documentary film archives, newsreel archives at UCLA, they list for each um, newsreel which films they showed and where they got them. So for many of the major events uh, in Europe in the mid and late 1930s, the Hearst newsreels were using um, uh, German film in their newsreels to tell these stories. So that Americans would, for example, learn about the reoccupation of the Rhineland by watching German film about it. Of cheering happy Rhinelanders, <laughs> right, right. welcoming their liberators. Um, <laughs> and it, the interesting bit is that none of, did any of these people actually suffer for it? Rather may have died before anyone could finger him, um, as you pointed out. And in fact, he was got out of the country, so he couldn't be fingered. But the others, did they ever pay a price in reputation? I mean, now, for example, the Daily Mail is at the forefront of uh, accusing people who support the Palestinians, like Jeremy Corbyn, of anti-Semitism. And of course, you know, somehow their own, let's, let's say, challenged record in this respect is completely overlooked. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, there is some coverage in the British newspapers of the of the Daily Mail's past. Um, but yes, for the most part, the Daily Mail did not did not suffer. And uh, the uh, in addition, the uh, as you say, Rothermere was spirited out of the country before he could personally pay a price. And then he was also um, and then he died, so he never faced it after the war. Um, you know, when when he let go of control of the Daily Mail, his son took it over, and his son was much more judicious about his coverage of foreign affairs. So that enabled the Daily Mail to sort of uh, transition into the post-war period without um, this shadow of being the Nazi newspaper. Um, uh, Beaver Brook, you know, had a really interesting life story in that uh, his old friend Churchill asked him to be the Minister of Aircraft Production um, in 1940. And so this enabled Beaver Brook to then take all of that energy that he had put into isolationism into making planes to make sure that the, the Germans did not invade England. And he did a very good job of this. And that enabled him to emerge from the war as, as a heroic figure rather than being Over viewed. Patriot, as, yes. Yes, yes. Um, so he did not suffer at all. He redeemed himself during the war. Um, and in addition- And was not mentioned in Michael Foote's book, The, the Guilty right. Men, uh, which was listed those who collaborated up till then. Right, exactly. And, you know, it's it's largely the same with the American press parents. I mean, they were never, uh, you know, they never like um, were prosecuted for espionage. The U.S. Justice Department considered it for the Chicago Tribune a couple of times, but never actually prosecuted them. 
So, you know, they were able to emerge from the war uh, viewed as certainly as right wing newspapers, but not as, um, you know, fascist newspapers that, um, you know, uh, should be shut down. They were was... most newspaper, most cities had many newspapers. And so it was possible to be an American consumer and avoid the, you know, the right wing viewpoints that you disagreed with. The when I read that chapter, it's very reminiscent of Mar-a-Lago. So the, the, the suggestion that the, the, the Daily News was it should be prosecuted for leaking a copy of the U.S. war plans, not leaking, broadcasting a copy of the U.S. war plans, was greeted with, sh with shouts of dictatorship and horror from the very same press that was perpetrating these deeds. Uh, and this sort of defensive, uh, preemptive howls of outrage is a very, very, a very effective um, mitigation tactic, which is still going on, isn't it? Oh yes, you know uh, I think that this is this is common um, in right wing media or right wing figures in general is the belief that the best defense is a good offense. So if you're accused of something, you turn it around and say, you know, no, the true, I'm the victim. And in fact, it is uh, the government that is looking into possible crimes I may have committed that is the the, the true um, villain here. Now, in Britain, there's a sort of semi-excuse is that these people were part of the establishment, which was the establishment before, during, and after the war in many ways. So it's very difficult to, it, it would almost be a form of um, suicide and in, in, in fraternal, fratricidal strife to have attempted to reckoning. Uh, in the US, th these people have very much made themselves out people compared with the Roosevelt administration. Was there any serious consideration given and you know, judiciously rejected of uh, re-examining the, the free press amendments uh, with a view to just how far they could go? Because these people were shouting fire in a crowded cinema, weren't they? Right. Well, what Roosevelt did was he used his fireside chats, which she had started using in 1933 as a way to uh, talk to the American people directly without having to uh, be mediated um, by the press barons. So he had started those fireside chats on the radio um, as a way to uh, get around the negative co coverage of the press barons who never he was, Roosevelt was never endorsed by a majority of the nation's um, uh, newspapers and it, he got less and less over time. So um, that's, that was his strategy. And then during the war, of course, he, he used it uh, even more and he did indirectly accuse the press barons a couple of times of, of treason, um, though he was careful not to name names. And he just said, you know, he called them bogus patriots um, who were actually undermining the government. But as again, as I say, he didn't name specific individuals. Well, that's one of the things we noticed about more recent years. Very, very few people named Rupert Murdoch or um, mm -hmm. Robert Maxwell. Um, people were scared to do so because of the consequences could be quite inflammatory. And it says a lot about the distribution of power. Um, Roosevelt used the fireside chat as a sort of... Uh, proto Twitter. Yes, he did. To get his message across, didn't he? I mean, it was, right, it was, exactly. Yeah, it's the same idea. Um, only, you know, I mean, I think there are obvious differences. <laughs> it is, it is this <clears throat> impulse where the president believes that he is not receiving, uh, his, his message is not getting across because of the, the negative um, news coverage. So he decides, well, I'm going to um, figure out a way to talk directly to the American people using a new medium. And the implication of what you laid out here is that freedom of speech is not necessarily the same as the freedom of press. Because you point out that polls showed that a consistent majority of American voters supported Roosevelt. Right. Whereas a consistent majority of newspapers uh, reviled and berated him. So, you know, how do we get that balance between the freedom of speech and the freedom of um, expression of the majority of the population against the, um, the freedom of the owners of the press 
to ram their versions down. Can you see any compromises, any way to um, ameliorate it? Certainly since the, um, the the fair and balanced rules disappeared, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's gone to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> but it was never quite there anyway. Right. I mean, I, I imagine that, that you and the Foreign Press Association probably have a better sense than I do of what it's what's going on today. I can say that historically, you know, uh, the United States did go through this long period where the news was very biased um, politically. And then after the war, the, a lot of these press barons died by, uh, you know, most of them by the mid 50s, all of them by the mid 60s. And, uh, you know, media conglomerates started taking over um, and they wanted to uh, get rid of the political bias because they wanted to reach the most consumers possible. Their, their motive was profit rather than, than ideology. Um, but there was this ideal of objectivity in mid-century America, um, which, you know, I, I think still animates much of the uh, American press anyway, but Some of, of course... Of course, there's also a lot of money now being poured into right wing media to uh, to counteract um, the reporters who are trying to just report the facts. The self image of the press is very much the set up in this era of just the news, just the facts, Mark. And yet, um, I know many people who have worked for operations like Murdoch, like Fox, and the others, who tell me that they would never be allowed to write that story. No. regardless of the truth or otherwise of it, it was just, you would not write that story. And there are some, you know, there are some things that just, if you relied upon particular sections of the press, you would never know that they'd happened. <laughs> because they're just ignored if, it, if it's not the news that the proprietor wants to hear. So, I mean, but there's no political pressure because everyone's scared of them. Right, right. I mean, that's, I think that's a difference um, from the 1930s. I mean, Roosevelt uh, was not afraid to take on the press barons. He knew they were opposing him and he, he waged a massive propaganda battle to try and win the argument. Um, it's a different situation in the UK because the, the government by the late 30s, the Chamberlain government was actually isolationist <laughs> as well, um, was uh, in agreement with, in foreign policy with Beaverbrook anyway. But in the U.S., it was definitely a clash between government and press, and um, Roosevelt was not afraid to take on that fight, and by and large, he won it. Uh, so I, you know, I would think if there's any lessons to take away, it would be to not be afraid of the power of the right wing media and to take it on, take them on directly. So the reaction of many politicians and um, you know, British politicians seem to think that. The way to get elected is to work out how to get invited to Rupert Murdoch's parties and get him along with you. There's, there, right. there are very few who actually stand up and say, hey, you're lying, you're deceitful, you have a twisted, poisoned agenda. Well, you know, that's that was the true then, too. I mean, who gave better parties than William Randolph Hearst, you know, up at Hearst Castle with all of the with the zoo and the and the movie stars and everything? That's that's very seductive. Mm, and good coverage afterwards is as well. <laughs> yeah. So do, do you see a way out of it for the day? I mean, we have these balancing uh, prerogatives. One, as I said, the freedom of expression, the right of a debate and free information. But can, that, can we have that when the press bans the side of the debate that it doesn't like? and effectively reinforce, if necessary, with lies, the bit that it does like. Uh, how can we reconcile that and still keep the traditional freedoms and newspaper traditions going? Well, I think the press is, is grappling with that now. Uh, and by and large, I think they're, they're, they're working towards a, a solution, you know, by, for example, labeling um, Trump's lie about the 2020 election, calling it the big lie. And every time they cite it, um, saying that this isn't true, that's something that's really sort of inconceivable pre-Trump, right? I mean, the, the press would, if you had a major political... Yeah, but we have a whole section of the press controlled by a news international that keeps hinting the opposite. Right, 
No, that's true. I mean, there are some people who say, well, uh, you know, there needs to be uh, more publicly funded media or there needs to be uh, more focus with uh, on the part of liberal philanthropists with the idea of funding uh, left wing media, you know, over, you know, an alternative to Fox News, like a real alternative, not like CNN, but like a real alternative. One that, of the first things that the Murdoch types did was to freeze funds for PBS and NPR. Yeah. Any possible independent media that uh, might get it. And that they 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 still take great pains to um how to steer those media uh, in lots of ways. Right. Well, no, they can be very easily intimidated because their funding could be cut off. Yes, and, and is often. <laughs> so is there anything else that um, we can um oh here we go. Simon Locke wants to know the media is behind firewalls. In the 1930s, people bought newspapers. Both tend to limit opinion to the people you listen to. Uh, what changes in the media landscape increased or decreased the potential for repeat of the 30s? Well, I mean, the media landscape is so much more uh, fractured now than in the 30s. I mean, in, in the 30s, uh, more than 80% of Americans read a daily newspaper every day. Uh, many of them read two, uh, and most people got most of their news from the newspapers. This began to change by the war, when more and more people started getting uh, their news from the radio, and then, of course, later it was television. Um, but still, you had a limited number of radio networks and, and TV networks. Today, you can, uh, you know, just choose your media, as you say, um, you know, the, the newspapers, the the ones that are most set up for having uh, investigative reporting are often behind firewalls. So it's the free stuff that gets circulated the most, and it is often, you know, extremely uh, disreputable. So it's much harder to uh, control, and it's much harder to make suggestions about, you know, how people should respond. I mean, I, the, it's sort of a lame response, but I think is the one I always give my students is that, you know, people should just be urged to seek out as many sources as possible and not just get their news from Facebook, um, but instead look for, you know, check three, four reputable news sites a day to get varying opinions and uh, learn what's going on in the world and not just sort of passively take whatever's, whatever's in, your, in your feed. Mm -hmm. reputable news sources uh, it's a quality it's a qualitative judgment though i mean there are some sources i used to think were quality uh, were reputable mm -hmm. and uh, became less and less so i uh, during, during the gulf war for example um any the view the view of several of us who said that there were no weapons of mass destruction right. was completely submerged but now it's suddenly accepted everybody was saying that well they weren't Right. Some of us lost work and lost jobs as a result of saying that. You know, um, pe people lost, commentators lost jobs for trying to point out that there was indeed, you know, some degree of parity here, that Saddam Hussein was a mean, evil bastard. But this was a lynching. <laughs> right. And, you know, even for mean, evil bastards, we don't necessarily believe in lynching. <laughs> There's a due processes involved. So it, 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 it's, I don't think... I think it's more difficult than we think. But when the time came in the 70s, in the name of uh, free enterprise, the bans on multiple holdings of the same media in the city disappeared. Right. The, fair, the fairness rule for getting a public license, because we tend to forget that the airwaves are actually a public property yeah. that these people are allowed to use. And that it's perfectly natural to put restrictions on them. No, you 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 can't advocate hate. You can't um, you, you you can't tell absolute lies on there. You do have to have some standards separate. But they've all disappeared. And to what extent do you think this was just a sort of um, neoliberal run for the exits? This is the way to make money. This is this is what America all is about. And how much do you think it was a small group of the? Uh, of the World War II isolationists planning the future. Because, you know, sometimes things 
accidents were happening this way and it does begin to look like a conspiracy. <laughs> right. Well, I, you know, certainly there was a small band of conservatives that were trying to uh, set up conservative media, starting with the Nixon administration, you know, you have Roger Ailes um, uh, advising Nixon and uh, working to create, you know, proto Fox News back in the 1970s. Um, you also have um, uh, in the Nixon years an assault on pro public broadcasting and, uh, you know, really um, decimating their budgets. So, the, you know, there's certainly, there's a conservative assault on the mainstream press from the late 1960s on, in part because of their coverage of the Vietnam War, because of the coverage of the civil rights movement, there's this growing conservative per perception that the um, mainstream press is liberal. And so therefore we need to have overtly conservative media to counteract that. And it's a, it's a long-term campaign. Um, so there's, there is that element of planning, but also, you know, I think your, your other suggestion is correct. And then it's just a general neoliberal impulse. Why is the government telling uh, media uh, outlets what kinds of opinions they have to broadcast? Why is it measuring the, the number of minutes per opinion? That's, that's not in our philosophy of you know, general neoliberalization of the economy and of the government. So it's, it's part of the zeitgeist as well as this, this clear plot by a few people from the beginning to uh, figure out a way to help conservative voices um, have uh, you know uh, it's not just conservative because a lot of a lot of the left-wing press will tell you that the liberal the mainstream media is totally biased and conservatives right. as well so the, the mainstream media quote unquote is yeah. uh, being hit on both sides no that's true um but I would say I mean you you gave some good arguments there for example about weapons of mass destruction um uh, that would support that. I would say also, though, that at least the mainstream media is, uh, you know, I believe they are striving towards objectivity, um, and they believe that they are trying to get at the truth despite their their individual biases. And of course, that's not at all the case in the right wing media, where they see it as a propaganda vehicle. Mm -hmm. So, is have you got a, a final takeaway for us? How do we avoid a new newspaper access or whatever the um, whatever Putin's symbol is? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, the, the the familiar dodge for historians here is say, you know, we just talk about the past. We don't predict the future. But, um, you know, I think you've brought up some some uh, good points about the fairness doctrine. You know, that could be reinstated. There could be more funding for public media. There could be more media literacy classes uh, for our high school uh, students, make that a required course so that uh, they know what kinds of media are out there, what are reliable sources, what, what to look for. I mean, I, um, I study conspiracy theories. And so um, I've uh, you know, been at conferences where people talk about how you can teach young adults early on to recognize what is a conspiracy theory by teaching them about how to recognize bias of in, in sources. And I think that this could, besides, you know, helping to slow the spread of conspiracy theories, ideally could also help to, you know, educate American or, or British or readers all over the world um, so that- but, but they, This is the difficulty I have with you. I agree with you, but- <laughs> In the end, your book is proving there was a conspiracy. <laughs> right. uh, so well, if, okay. If, if, if you try and denigrate conspiracies per se, when the real one comes, we might miss it because we're conditioned to avert our eyes from conspiracies because it will be dismissed. Right. Well, I mean, it, it wasn't a conspiracy in the sense that, that you know, these people were... Uh, had a plot to control everything all over the world. It's just they had their, uh, you know, ideological perception of fascism as either, you know, a great innovation or at least something not to be concerned about. And they were determined to use their power and to work with one another to use their power to convince 
their readers uh, that this was the case and that the United States and, and Great Britain should allow Hitler to take over Europe and then, you know, uh, not concern itself with the consequences. Or allow Putin's Russia to take over Ukraine or, or wash your hands of it. Because <laughs> we're not even making money. We're giving them the weapons. We're not selling them to them. <laughs> right. No benefits at all. Okay, look, it's, Catherine, this has been a fascinating discussion. I think uh, we, we probably need to, uh, maybe we should have a seminar at some point on conspiracy theories and how uh, how the media can address them safely <laughs> without missing the real ones. <laughs> but thank you very much for being with us today and thank you everybody out there. We have other briefings coming up and we're always concerned about the uh, issues of free speech. We're looking at issues on, you know, to, should we ban Russia today? Um, we don't actually, but should we make it easy for them when they tell lies in front, front of everyone? It's, these are serious questions and they need serious answers rather than reflexive ones. And I think Catherine's book goes a long way to unpicking some of the historical and social background for this. So we'll see you again soon. Uh, do join the National of the, of the, Foreign, the, the Foreign Press Association. Uh, and remember, those of you in New York, we have a drinks evening on the 13th uh, to welcome the end of COVID where people can get together at, at dare I mention it, Maggie's place. And because they're all Irish in this bar, I'm fairly sure it's not the Maggie you might think of <laughs> whose place it's being revered. So uh, do come along. Look forward to seeing you. Please join the FPA, put your name on our list and buy Catherine's book. As I told her before, it is actually much more lively than a, your average university press. The Yale University Press publishes it, but you know I'm surprised a commercial publisher didn't run with it. Maybe this time yet, who knows? <laughs> Thanks very much, Catherine. All right, thank you. Thank you.